Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kim Harvish and I'm here today with um, uh, Tisha Dalton and Frida Toth and Sandy Rhodes and we're going to be talking about Votes for Women celebrating the suffrage centennial. Um, so first, first uh, Tisha is going to lead us in a song. Hello, I'm Tisha Dalton and I will be talking about suffrage music. Most suffrage songs were written to popular songs of the day, songs that most people knew. And then at the meetings or events, they would just pass out new lyrics to the old tunes. So we're going to look at a couple of those today. The first one being Keep Woman in Her Sphere. It's set to the tune of Old Lang Syne, a Scottish song not written, but first recorded in writing by the Scottish poet and bard Robert Burns. The suffrage lyrics appear in the Suffrage Song Campaign Songbook, published in Lincoln, Nebraska in 1882. The lyricist is noted as E. Estabrook. I believe this to be Experience Estabrook, 1813 to 1894, who was appointed Attorney General of Nebraska Territory in 1855. His daughter, Caroline Augusta Gussie Estabrook Clowry, was the composer G. Estabrook, who was quite a rock star in her day, selling over one million copies of sheet music. Verse one suggests that women must know their place, and it is in the home. One argument of the time revolved around women influencing their husbands and therefore not needing the vote. Verse two brings into question temperance. Another major argument for giving women the right to vote was that women could control, have control over their own inheritance, wages, custody of their children, and particularly if married, a drunkard. Temperance and suffrage seem to go hand in hand from the beginning. The third verse has the narrator at last speaking to a reasonable man. He comes across as educated and possibly an attorney as Mr. Estabrook himself was. Finally, a glimmer of hope from the patriarchy. I have a neighbor, one of those not very hard to find, who know it all without debate and never change their mind. I asked him what of women's rights, he said in tone severe, my mind on that is all made up, keep woman in her sphere. I saw a man in tattered garb forth from the grog shop come. He squandered all his cash for drink and starved his wife at home. I asked him should not woman vote. He answered with a sneer. I've taught my wife to know her place, keep woman in her sphere. I met an earnest, thoughtful man not many days ago, who pondered deep all human law, the honest truth to know. I asked him what of woman's cause, the answer came sincere. Her rights are just the same as mine, let woman choose her sphere. The next two songs were written by lyricist Eugenie Ray Smith. She was a prominent New York City suffragist and lawyer. According to her obituary in the New York Times on July 10th, 1914, Mrs. Ray Smith was chairman of the Queens County Women's Political Union. The WPU, formerly the Equality League of Self-Supporting Women, was created by Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, Harriet Stanton Blatch, when she returned from Europe to find the New York State suffrage movement stagnant. And these are their colors on my sash today. How Can Such Things Be and Votes for Women were two of the 26 songs found in the Equal Suffrage Song Sheath by Mrs. Rod Smith. The second edition came out in 1915. Mrs. Rye Smith appears to, believe, appears to be the lyricist for these songs, as all of the songs included in this volume are set to familiar tunes of the day. 
How Can Such Things Be is set to the tune of Stephen Foster's minstrel song, Oh Susanna, which was first performed in 1847. Votes for Women Sure to Win is set to the tune of Yankee Doodle. I came from California where the women folk are free. I'm bound for Pennsylvania, old fashioned folk to see. Election night, the day I left, and every poll all right. I crossed the line, you lost my breath. Election was a fight. I traveled long, I traveled fast, I went by rail and river. Election sites in many a state, they'd make a home and shiver. Some men they say to decent are, they will not come to vote. Says I invite the women out, and then a change you'll note. Oh men voters, how can such things be? In all this free America, only one half can be free. Then came a revelation when I neared my journey's end. I saw the lowest ranks of men to polling places wend. While wistfully some women gazed a block or two away. As to the assessor's door they passed their taxes for to pay. If I could run for president, I'd want a good clean fight. I'd want the women on my side, I'd grant their equal right. I'd pledge my word of honor in the list to make things fair. And if they ask me for a deal, I'd make it on the square. Oh, men voters, how can such things be? In all this free America, only one half can be free. It happened once in England fair that woman's mind got started On thinking suffrage rights her share from her unjustly parted The laws and taxes she should heed in which she had no say, sir To her fair thoughts seemed false indeed she cried will not obey, sir Votes for women keep it up, never mind what party Votes for women show to win, sing it strong and hearty We'll show the world through word and deed, by us the vote is wanted. The legislators now take heed, our courage is undaunted. The struggle waxes fierce and strong, we we'll zeal these women burning. We'll bring the men to own their wrong, all weak traditions spurning. Votes for women, keep it up, never mind what party. Votes for women, show to win, sing it strong and hearty. Two cousins now across the street, strong hope is thus imparted. They need no force to set them free, they turn to men through hearted. That women will in this good land, tis done before you speak, sir. With loyal word and willing hand, they're given what they seek, sir. Votes for women, keep it up, never mind what party. Votes for women, show to win, sing it strong and hearty. Arise, arise, brave woman, there is work for you to do. Show the world that love is wisdom and love's promises are true. Break the bonds that hold you captive, for the world has need of you. And we'll go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go marching on. Do you need a sound to rouse you? Hear the little children cry. Do you need a sight to stir you? See the old who hopeless die. Shall they call to you in misery while you stand heedless by? No, we'll go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go marching on. We will give the world fair daughters, and those daughters shall be free. They shall stand beside their brothers on the ground of liberty. And the cause of right shall prosper on the land and on the sea, as we go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go marching.
marching on. So arise, arise, brave woman, there is work for you to do. Show the world that love is wisdom and love's promises are true. Break the bonds that hold you captive, for the world has need of you. And we'll go marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go marching on. New York actually uh, has a place in uh, suffrage history because we were the first state east of the Mississippi to grant suffrage uh, to women uh, enabled to, to vote in statewide offices. Um, we were the 12th state to grant women suffrage. Um, and as you can see, the list here it goes back to 1890 uh, with Wyoming uh, uh, gaining the right uh, for women to vote. Um, and I'm only going to go back and I'm going to start this journey in 1848. Some people would say that we could go back further than that when we talk about the women's movement, uh, women's suffrage movement. But um, most people do go to 1848. Um, but one thing that I do want you to, to think about as I'm talking today is this is, this is the highlight reel, right? <laughs> Any of the subjects that I talk about today could be a program in and of themselves. Um, but as, uh, one thing I do want you to take away from this is as we look back on the road to suffrage, um, it's important to remember that it wasn't a unified uh, movement. Um, we need to dispel the notion that women were unified. It's kind of hard for us to believe, but there were a lot of anti-suffragists who were women, uh, as well as the pro-suffragists. And then within the movement, even within the pro-suffrage movement, there were a lot of divisions. Uh, a lot of people had different views. A lot of people had different tactics. Um, so not everything, you know, this wasn't a unified, um, it wasn't everybody was on the same page all of the time. So if we think about July 13th, 1848, in Waterloo, New York, at Jane Hunt's home, uh, she called together uh, four of her friends, Lucretia Mott, Martha Wright, Marianne McClintock, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Elizabeth was living in Seneca Falls at the time. Um, during the tea, they organized the first women's rights convention to be held in Seneca Falls six days later. I always like to point that out because they didn't have social media. <laughs> so I think it's pretty impressive that on the 13th they planned for a convention on, this, on the 19th. Um, what were their grievances behind, besides suffrage? That's something that we should talk about. Um, if we look at the Morning Herald from Gloversville on March 17th, uh, 1915, you'll see that they list some of the things that the, that the women were upset about. In 1800, no married woman could hold any property or make a will. No woman could go to college. No woman could enter any trade, industry, or profession outside the home. In 1821, the first female seminary opened in Troy by Emma Willard. And um, it was considered that a girl to study Latin or geometry was considered ridiculous. What, what would be the point? In 1848, New York, first, there was the first time that they gave married women the right to hold and control their own property. So that was a huge um, step in the right direction. But one thing else that they did not have in 1848 is they didn't have guardianship of their children. Between 1860 and 1893, the state gave and took away from women the joint guardianship of their children. In 1893, the Joint Guardianship Act was established for the last and final time. Um, and the quote from that is, the law still discriminates in favor of man in matters concerning the custody of the child. So all of these things were things that women were, were thinking and talking about in addition to the right to vote. And of course, they thought that if they had the right to vote, they could address some of these issues. 
So the convention that they planned in six days took place at the Wesleyan Chapel in Seneca Falls. There were 300 people in attendance. 42 of them were men. Frederick Douglass was one of the men there and he spoke on the second day. On the first day, in addition to Lucretia Mott's speech, Elizabeth Cady Stanton introduced and read her Declaration of Sentiments. It's symbolically modeled after the Declaration of Independence. And I'm just going to read the, the intro to it. It's a, it's a document worth reading. You can find it. <laughs> um, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Having deprived her of his, this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, he has oppressed her on all sides. And it's actually inscribed, if you go to the Wesleyan uh, Chapel there in Seneca Falls, it's actually inscribed on plaques uh, outside. So most of us have heard of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, and we kind of meld them together for good reason, but they did not start out this journey together. Um, Susan was not anywhere near Seneca Falls in 1848. Um, it wasn't until a few years later that she traveled to Seneca Falls and she had heard of Elizabeth and uh, she asked to meet her and it was during that time that they formed an alliance that did span decades. Uh, Susan was never married. Um, she was a Quaker. She devoted her life to causes like abolition, prohibition, and women's suffrage and she traveled the world uh, spreading her message. Um, Elizabeth, on the other hand, was a wife and a mother, um, and until her children were grown, she mostly was at home writing. Um, so frequently, Susan would visit Elizabeth's home and take care of the children so Elizabeth could write. And Elizabeth's husband has a wonderful quote that I, that I, I think sort of sums it up. Susan stirs the porridge, Lizzie stirs Susan, and Susan stirs the world. <laughs> so it wasn't that Susan uh, didn't use her own words, but she did love to present the speeches of Elizabeth and um, they were great collaborators. Um, another woman that I personally think does not get enough t attention and, and a lot of people do have not heard of her name is Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And her home is in Fayetteville, New York, right outside of Syracuse. So if you're ever in the area, it's a great place to visit. Um, she was actually sort of a triumvirate of the three. There was Susan and Elizabeth and Matilda um, initially. And they actually wrote the history of women's suffrage together. Um, and then there was a parting of the ways. Uh, like I said earlier, the women just didn't, they had, they had different... Um, uh, views on the subject and they also had different um, ways of approaching um, this the suffrage movement that got on each other's nerves. <laughs> so Susan and Matilda actually, I mean Susan and Elizabeth actually did a pretty good job of writing Matilda out of the history books um, but um, we're trying to write her back in. Uh, she was very she was very instrumental. Um, she actually uh, became just very discouraged with the slow pace of the of the movement and she was also alarmed by the conservative uh, religious movement that um, was trying to establish a Christian state. So in 1893, she formed the Women's National Liberal Union, and she also wrote a book called Women, Church, and State. Um, her home was, uh, just like some of the others, she was very involved in other things. So she, her home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And she was an outspoken advocate for the Native Americans, um, and she was adopted into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Indians. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit later about the influence of the uh, Native Americans on the suffrage movement, and she was very, very involved in, in that. So in 1869, as one of those uh, things that we talked about, there was a split. Um, so there's two factions. Um, there's the New York-based National Women's Suffrage Association, which was created by Susan and Elizabeth. 
and they opposed the 15th Amendment, which had been proposed at that time. They said, no, 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 we're not, we're not expanding uh, the right to vote unless it includes women. Forget it, we're not supporting it. Uh, but then there was a Boston-based group, um, the American Woman Suffrage Association, and that was created by Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, and Julia Ward Howe. And they said, hey, as long as more people are getting the right to vote, we're moving in the right direction, eventually it'll include women. Well, so they, so they split, and there were these two opposing, not opposing, but two groups that were working sort of separately. Um, in 1870, the 15th Amendment was ratified, and it granted voting rights to all men without regard to race and color, and that included former slaves. And you can see the banner on this page says, Votes for Women on a Yellow Background. In that year of 1869, the NWSA, the National Women's Suffrage Association, adopted yellow as its color. And a lot of times you'll see sunflowers being used uh, as an as a emblem, um, and they use that as well. So that was 1869, 1870. In 1890, the two groups did come back together, realized that they were, they were better together, <laughs> and they merged and became the National American Woman Suffrage Association also referred to as NASA, N-A-W-S-A. -S so NASA became the most mainstream and most visible group um, right up until 1920 for pro-suffrage. Um, you can see on these, these beautiful um, badges and things that they had at their conventions. I, I, ever since seeing them, every time I go to a convention, I want a nice metal <laughs> with a real ribbon on it, right? Um, so you can see from the, pre the list of presidents I have there, you know, names that mostly we know. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Carrie Chapman Catt, Anna Howard Shaw. So the, the real movers and shakers in the, in the organization um, did become president of that group. So we need to, uh, need to address the African American women. Um, and this really, really, really should be a, a topic of its own <laughs> um, because um, the, um, it, it's such an important um, part of the, America, of the women's suffrage movement. Um, and just like uh, any other time of our, in our country's history, um, there were divisions about race. And so the suffragists were no different. There were a lot of suffragists who did not want the American, uh, African American women to be involved. They thought that men surely wouldn't give them the vote if it meant that African American women were going to get the vote. Um, and then there were others that, uh, that you know, certainly supported them. Um, and African American women were very interested in suffrage, just, uh, just as the 15th Amendment gave the African American men the right to vote. So um, they, they actually had to sort of form their own suffrage movement. Um, they, some of them were members of NASA, um, but they did have their own local clubs. Um, and there was a National Association of Colored Women. Um, Mary Church Terrell uh, it was, a, was a, one of the main supporters. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett and the former slave Harriet Tubman, those three women formed the National Association of Colored Women. Uh, you've probably heard of Sojourner's Truth's uh, Ain't I a Woman speech. That was given in 1851. Um, there was a 1913 uh, parade in Washington, D.C. that I'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, Alice Paul uh, had a lot to do with setting that up, and she actually uh, at first did not want African-American women to march in the parade. Um, and then she agreed that they could march if they were segregated and marched at the end of the parade. Well, Ida B. Wells, who was a noted, noted journalist, um, she refused to do that. <laughs> and so she marched with her state's convention, uh, her state's delegation, excuse me. Um, so the 19th, and she just actually had a... Um, she has a statue being erected um, this year, I believe, Ida, Ida Wells. 
So the 19th Amendment, when it was uh, ratified, it enfranchised all women on paper. But because of state laws and other practices, um, the, um, it basically most women in the South were, um, were um, disenfranchised, most African American women, um, until the s civil rights passed in the 1960s. Um, I mentioned the Huadnasani Indians. So uh, imagine that a, a lot of these women that we're talking about, or the, the, the actual the birthplace of this movement, was in central New York. And there were a lot of Huadnasani um, Indians living there, and they were interacting with the um, ladies. Uh, Garrett Smith, who was a famous abolitionist and a cousin of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, you know, he had a lot of interactions, uh, he and his family, and they, they were very involved in the suffrage movement. So these women are looking at these uh, Native American women, and they're realizing a couple of things. One, they sure dressed a lot more comfortably. <laughs> so, you know, they're wearing, you know, tunics and, um, you know, kind of... Um, uh, loose trousers and that kind of thing, and so that that sort of forms the idea of the um, the bloomers and the Turkish um, uh, Turkish uh, style outfits that some of the suffragists wore for a while. But the other thing is that the um, the Native Americans are very much of a matrilineal society, so the women actually choose the chiefs, um, and if the chief is doing something they don't really like, they will warn him three times, and if he doesn't listen to them, he, they can dehorn him, is what they call it, basically um, uh, oust him. And they had a lot of other say in their governance of their nations, and so these um, suffragists were looking at this saying, hmm, here's, here's a a nation, right, that has a lot of women that are actively involved in their governance, why can't we have the same thing? It obviously works. <laughs> so um, there was there are a lot of books out about that, and uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage um, Center has, um, like I said, she was very involved in it. So uh, you can um, definitely found, find information about it. So it was quite an interesting um, correlation. Uh, correlation that we don't always think about when we think about the suffrage movement. So this picture I just put in here for fun. Um, I mean, who doesn't want to have a tea party in an alleyway? Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I personally love tea, and I love the idea of afternoon tea, and so did the suffragists, so I have to bring that up. Um, Think about the time uh, you could not, uh, as a woman, say to your friend, hey, you want to go out to lunch? Want to go out to dinner? Want to go have a few drinks? No, that was not done, right? If, you, if there was, in fact, a restaurant where you could go and eat, you would probably have to enter from the um, back door and probably have a, uh, they probably had a dining room just for women. Otherwise, you would be a loose woman. <laughs> so, as tea becomes popular, and you know, afternoon tea and tea rooms that uh, that came up, either you know, just a single tea room, or perhaps um, one of the things that was popular was to have a tea room in a fancy hotel. That was considered proper for women to go out for tea. So that's one reason that we see this being a, a good part of the suffragist movement because it was a place that they could go and sit and strategize and, and talk about what they could do next. It was a place to gather. They saw an affinity between themselves and the Boston Tea Party also because taxation without representation, right? That was one of the, that was one of the calls for su women's suffrage. You know, we were taxed on property, but we couldn't, we had no, no way to uh, voice our opinion about anything. So you can see from the blue and uh, white um, 
Alva Belmont, who was a very, who was a very wealthy suffragist. Um, she uh, created this set of uh, china uh, that says "Votes for Women" on it. You can get reproductions today, um, and other people created uh, china ware that was for the cause. Um, and you can see at the bottom um, the box of tea is actually a ticket to attend um, a fundraiser um, at Fenial Hall. Um, they also package tea to sell with names like Equality Tea. Um, and they also, uh, like I said, designed and sold these teapots and cups and saucers. So the next time you go have tea, remember the suffragists did that. Um, this is another interesting little thing that happened uh, during this time. The Statue of Liberty was dedicated. And no women were invited to the dedication. Um, so here's what the uh, New York Suffrage Association said. On October 28th, the men of the nation, presidents, governors, and potentates, propose in solemn state to unveil this Statue of Liberty embodied as a woman in a land where no woman has political liberty. What a monstrous absurdity that men should unite to do honor to liberty represented by a woman while refusing liberty to women. We propose in some suitable way to emphasize this occasion. So they hired boats that took them out um, and they circled the uh, statue uh, and they unfurled banners and they made noise <laughs> and tried to disrupt as best they could. Um, there were only two women attending the actual unveiling, and I believe one was a wife of one of maybe the, the man who created the monument, and uh, a daughter. The wives of the American committee members were not even allowed on the uh, island. They were forced to watch the proceedings from a Navy vessel um, off the island. Um, bicycling was also uh, very important to the um, cause. Um, Susan B. Anthony said, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. I think it has done more to emancipate woman, women than anything else in the world. It gives women a feeling of freedom and self-reliance. I stand and rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on the wheel the picture of free, untrammeled womanhood. So think about how women had to get around before that, right? It, it involved other people. <laughs> it involved a carriage or something, you know? So this was really um, a, a game changer. Now, take a look at the picture I have there. Uh, how many of you would like to ride a bi bike dressed the way they are? Um, not me. <laughs> but they managed. Um, now these women have on long dresses, of course, and what else are they wearing? They're wearing corsets, right? And about, uh, I don't know, maybe six layers of clothing underneath. Um, they've got their hat on. Now if you look at this picture here in the um, right-hand corner, you can see there, there is a bicycling costume. So they did come up with this idea of sort of trousers, but they were very blousy. And um, this illustration was in uh, the model of new, the model new woman, a study in bloomers, and the caption reads: "The offensive costume was made of rich dark velvet, cut quite full and gathered neatly at the knee." So, to some, it was offensive. <laughs> um, and the other thing that you had to be aware of when you rode a bicycle is you did not want to have bicycle face. Um, they, uh, they reported quite often in newspapers that if you rode a bicycle and you had this kind of frown on your face and kind of worried about any, you know, con or concentrating on what you were doing, you would end up with bicycle face and, you know, that wasn't a good thing. <laughs> Now what about the anti-suffragists, right? They um, had a lot of different arguments. Uh, it wasn't just one thing. Uh, these three cartoons or postcards that I have here 
um, I think kind of think um, name a lot of them so you've got the the pants what will men wear when women wear pants my gosh we're gonna we're just gonna take over they're not gonna you know we're gonna start wearing pants and the whole world will go to <laughs> The uh, group of women there, can you recognize any woman in that group? The one in the very middle is Susan B. Anthony. So this is a cartoon drawing of a bunch of women in a club, smoking cigars, drinking, and here she is. She's lighting a pipe uh, there in the middle. Um, so we certainly didn't want to have any of that going on. And then you have this uh, postcard here of this poor husband he's got an apron on he's doing the laundry and the sign above says everybody works but mother she's a suffragette <laughs> <laughs> so the idea was we were we were gonna the women were going to start doing man's jobs and then wet men were gonna have to start doing women's jobs and it was gonna upset the whole order of things um, this is an interesting one on the cover of Harper's Weekly in 1907. You have a bunch of, uh, or a group of um, well-to-do women sa talking to senators saying, oh, save us senators from ourselves, right? So we're, we're going to do ourselves in by getting this right to vote. And the ad here is from um, the Women's Anti-Suffrage Association of Massachusetts. And I won't read the whole thing, but it does say in this ad that women's suffrage increases taxes, it injures women, it increases divorce, and it is a costly and dangerous experiment. It's also part of the feminist movement and is wanted by every socialist, every IWW, and every Mormon. So we had to be careful. Uh, you can see the cartoon there. Also, they wanted to depict suffragists as kind of old crones. They were just mad at everything and didn't have any femininity. Um, and so that's what that's about. At, eight, at 15, a little pet. At 20, a little coquette. At 40, not married yet. And at 50, a suffragette. Um, Alice Chittenden, president of the New York State Anti-Suffrage Association, spoke on October 3rd, 1917, saying, if the suffragists really want to be patriotic, then instead of spending the day in a parade uh, where they're actually wasting five years, five months, and many days, considering the number of women, um, why don't they do something really worthwhile? Why don't they do some really worthwhile work? Um, so they, they really took umbrage with everything that the suffragists did. And this is a little pamphlet that was written by the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage. Um, and it says that it, it, one of the reasons is it, be, it means competition of women with men instead of cooperation. Um, and when boats of women can accomplish no more than boats of men. Why waste time, energy, and money without result? So without me talking any more about anti-suffragists, I'm going to introduce you to one. My name is Jeanette Davis. I am a wife. I am a mother. It is my honor and duty to speak to you today about women's suffrage. I am, as are all who hold the family dear, against women's suffrage. Men and women are simply different. Each sex is ideally suited to the roles we currently hold. Some of us believe it is not only a mistake, but an injustice to add politics to the roles already taken by women. Uh, some believe that the anti take a, a dog in the manger approach or that we are organized merely to keep the ballot from our sisters. But the anti attitude is defensive, not aggressive. We are organized to preserve our rights given to us by the men of the state. 
And the question is, would equal suffrage benefit the state, our homes, our women? Conservation is the watchword of the day. We, anti-suffragists, are organized to conserve and preserve the greatest of all roles for women, that of homemaking and motherhood. So by the early 1900s, uh, we have the old guard sort of uh, aging out um, and dying. Um, and so we have a new generation taking over the work. Um, Alice Paul, who I mentioned earlier, she was a Quaker from New Jersey. Um, and she had gone to England and gotten a taste of what they were doing over there in the suffrage movement. Um, she got very involved. She threw some shoes at the prime minister. Um, and she was arrested and jailed three times while she was in England. Um, so she returns home and she wants to bring some of that fervor to the women's movement here. She thinks that we're just being too passive about it, that we need to really make, you know, make noise, make ourselves heard more. She starts the uh, National Women's Party, and that button there is um, the NWP. Another woman who went to England uh, and got involved and came back with some ideas um, was um, Harriet Stanton Blatch. And if you recognize the name Stanton, it's because she's Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter. And she had gone to England uh, with her husband. And um, when she comes home, she decides, uh, and she's working with Alice, they decide to, uh, but she was really the moving force, behind the first parade in New York City in 1910. Um, when 89 members of the Men's League for Women's Suffrage joined thousands of women in the second annual parade in 1911 and marched with them down Fifth Avenue, the men who were marching with them were taunted and catcalled by rowdy spectators who enjoined them to hold up your skirts, girls. Um, and if you look at the picture there of the marchers, you'll see a lot of them are carrying something. Um, might wonder what that is. That's our soap boxes, right? So anytime they could, they could put that down, stand up, and and give a little give a little talk. The, it's a beautiful picture there in the in the right hand corner. That's Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Harriet, her daughter, is on the right, and her um, granddaughter is on the left. Her granddaughter goes on to become the first woman graduate of civil engineering from. Uh, Cornell University. Um, the Men's League for Women's Suffrage was formed in New York in 1909. Um, and you can see them marching here in the 1915 suffrage parade. Um, their president wrote in 1912, we men can make it easier and happier work if we join in it and no longer stand aside as too many men have done leaving the women to toil and struggle, making up in vital energy what they lack in political power. And then the, a very famous parade was in 1913 in um, Washington, D.C. Um, it was right before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. Um, the parade included nine bands, four mounted brigades, 20 floats, and a performance near the Treasury Building. It was organized by Alice Paul. This is the one where she did not want the African-American women to, to march at first and then agreed that they could march if they were in the back. And you can see this drawing on the left-hand side about how complicated it was to organize it. <laughs> and the picture there, uh, the color picture is the front of the program. So the parade appeared to have a pretty good start. However, Pennsylvania Avenue soon became blocked uh, with thousands of spectators. The spectators, who were mostly men, started to jostle the parade uh, marchers um, and actually physically assaulting them. And the police did very little to stop it um, because they just figured the women should have stayed home, that they were asking for it by being out in public and marching. Over 100 marchers were hospitalized due to their injuries. And it also, if you're familiar at all with Washington, D.C., it took six hours 
to go from the Capitol to Constitution Hall. So it was a, and, and you can see from the picture, you can <laughs> barely move. The woman who rode this white horse that's pictured here um, is someone that you might have heard of because she has a connection to the Adirondacks, and that is Inez Milholland. Um, she lived um, most of the year in New York City, but her family had uh, a summer place, which is now Meadowmount School of Music, if you're familiar with it, um, in Lewis, New York. She went to Vassar. She went to New York University. She became a lawyer who worked for the disadvantaged, um, and she also was a, um, uh, worked with uh, Harriet Stanton Blatch and Alice Paul. So in um, 19... 16, um, the women in the 12 western states that I put up there earlier, uh, the first slide I had, the 12 western states where they could vote for president, um, they, were high, they were sort of, uh, not highlighted, they were um, focusing, the women's, move, uh, women's suffrage movement was focusing on those 12 states because it was a lot easier to get, well they thought, to get women to vote for women's suffrage than it was to get men to vote for women's suffrage, right? So they were spent a lot of time out in the West, um, you know, doing circuits and, and speaking. So Inez Milholland, she was dramatic, she was a she was an excellent speaker, she was a very attractive, um, she was very well known, and she was one of the most popular, what they called flying envoys. However, and uh, she was given she was not well when the last time she went out to the West, and the doctors advised her not to go. Um, but she was so um, passionate about it, she thought she'd be okay. But in October 1916, she collapsed on stage in Los Angeles, and she died a month later. Um, and there was a ceremony for her at the Capitol in December 1916. Um, so the last words that she spoke on the stage were, how long must women wait for liberty? And that became a rallying cry and a motto for the uh, movement. Um, one other person that I need to mention is Carrie, Cat Ch Carrie Chapman Cat. That's a tongue twister. Um, she had been tapped by Susan B. Anthony to head NASA in 1900. Um, but she left that after a while and went traveling with her husband, and then she returned in 1915, serving as president for a second time. Um, she actually is credited with New York winning the vote in 1917. Um, and I'll discuss that a little bit more when I get to 1917. Um, the suffrage amendment was on the ballot in five states in 1915, and New York was one of them. Um, Mrs. Uh, Raymond Brown, and actually I forget her first name, but isn't that odd? You know, back then they didn't tell them first names very often. It was always you were Mrs. whatever your husband's name was. Uh, she actually went, came to Glens Falls and spoke. Um, and she presented strong arguments in, in favor of equal suffrage. And, and mostly said most women are dependent on the law and the enforcement of law for conditions that make decent homes and decent living possible, yet they are denied any voice in the making of that law or in its administration. So everybody was very disappointed when, when that did not pass here in New York and, or any of the other five states in 1915. But by 1917, you can see that um, by these ads that a lot of um, prominent people including President Wilson, uh, was, was sort of making noise that it would be okay to, um, to pass women's suffrage. Um, I love this banner in the parade. New York State denies the vote to criminals, lunatics, idiots, and women. And that's really how women who were pro-suffrage felt. You know, they were relegated to linked in, lumped in with the criminals and the lunatics. Um, and Carolyn um, Nordstrom, who summered in Lake George, uh, she had a letter to the editor in 1917 
that says we can cross the border into Canada and there, under the same government from whose tyranny we were once liberated, we can enjoy equal political freedom with women. But by stepping over an imaginary line into this, quote, land of the free, we are classed politically with imbeciles and criminals. And this postcard here is my favorite. For the work of a day, for the taxes we pay, for the laws we obey, we want something to say. So, um, like I said, in 1915, it did not pass. So what NASA did is they turned a laser focus on New York because uh, it was um, NASA's opinion that we should go state by state and eventually if enough states passed it, it would be a done deal. Um, the National Women's Party, headed by Alice Paul, no, they didn't want any part of a state by state. They just wanted to get it done, get the, get the amendment passed. But Carrie Chapman Catt, uh, you know, we, we do have to give her credit in New York State because she did. She turned a laser focus. There were thousands and thousands of um, pamphlets printed in many different languages trying to get the immigrant vote. Um, she had, I think it says here, it was the largest individually signed petition ever assembled, eventually totaling over a million names. Um, she had people going on country roads and in tenement buildings getting petitions signed. So she really, um, you know, I, of course she didn't do it alone, but she, <laughs> she really was a, the mover behind that. Um, and I don't know about Saratoga County, but it's uh, in um, 1917, the city of Glens Falls and Washington County voted in favor and Warren County remained opposed. But it did pass. Um, and just going to talk a little bit about what was happening in the Glens Falls area. Um, there were political equality clubs, there were suffrage study clubs. Um, Actually, not Glens Falls, but uh, in Washington County, the uh, Easton's, Easton um, Suffrage Club over there, they are, they're a wealth of information because a lot of their minutes are, are available. They're, um, they kept them. Um, there were delegations from Warren County to the New York City and Washington, D.C. parades. There were many rallies, uh, both pro and con, held in the area. This picture here is the interior of the Baptist Church in Glens Falls. In 1896, Susan B. Anthony was there for a rally, and it was so big they had to call in the police uh, just to maintain control of the crowd. She was so impressed with Glens Falls that she suggested that the uh, New York State Suffrage Convention be held there in 1900. So now I'm going to introduce you to a woman who was at both of those events. My name is Eva King. I was born during the Civil War in 1863, and I lived to see the Eisenhower administration of 1958. I saw the first cars. I saw the first airplanes. And I saw American women voting for the first time in national election. It may be hard to imagine today a time when women were not allowed to partake in the most rudimentary part of our democracy, voting. I'm sure many things that have become mundane and everyday for women today were not allowed to me. In fact, I remember when the Glens Falls Trust Company opened its doors in the early 1900s. I was in my early 30s and they advertised proudly that now women would be able to do their own banking through a back door with their own teller in a separate room. It wouldn't be seemly for a lady to walk in the front door on her own and approach a teller. Girls did not receive the same education as boys. You see, the men in power at the time worried about how education for girls and equal rights for women might upset their apple cart. They argued that if schools were open equally to girls as they were to boys, well, then women would be educated and would do nothing but write books. They campaigned 
that if women had the right to vote, well, men would have to stay home and do the housework and raise the children while women went out to work or maybe ran for office. Most men were greatly opposed to any kind of equal rights for women. My husband, Charles King, was an attorney. He was graduated from Dartmouth College and admitted to the bar at the age of 23 in 1883. He was a man of great integrity. And though he did worry about someone doing us harm in the suffrage movement, he supported my efforts. And in 1894, a group of local women formed the Warren County Women's Suffrage Group. And we met at the First Baptist Church on Maple Street in Glens Falls. I shared the dais with Susan B. Anthony herself. Now she was from Adams, Massachusetts, but was raised in Washington County near, near Greenwich. On that day, the church was packed and the local law officials were on hand to keep the crowds under control. With Miss Anthony looking on, I was one of three women who proposed a resolution to Warren County in the city of Glens Falls. Now, historically speaking, the people of Washington County and the city of Glens Falls were very supportive of our efforts, but the people of Warren County were opposed. So impressed was Miss Anthony with this tremendous supportive turnout in 1894 that she called for the National American Women's Suffrage Association to hold their New York State annual conference in Glens Falls in October of 1900. It was the 32nd annual conference for New York State and a great success for Glens Falls. The visiting de delegates stayed at the Rockwell House Hotel, which no longer stands, but was at the Circle in Glens Falls, and it was a grand hotel. The delegates were entertained there, as well as having some meetings for the convention at the hotel. Many of the meetings for the convention were held just down the road on Glen Street at Ordway Hall. You can visit Ordway Hall now. It's a spot coffee. On hand to speak at this convention was Glens Falls' own Addison Colvin. He was just finishing up his term as New York State Treasurer. He was a dynamic speaker and a great supportive, supporter of our cause. Unfortunately, Susan B. Anthony was ill that year and unable to attend, but her sister, Mary Anthony, came and spoke in her place. Our keynote speaker was Carrie Chapman Catt, president of National American Women's Suffrage Association. Now she was from Wisconsin, but spent many summers in the Adirondacks and was well known for voicing her disdain for the narrow mindedness of the men at the time. She once inflamed the local gentry when she proclaimed that Northern New York is a fine place to get out of. I remember her speech so well, I could almost recite it word for word. She proclaimed that the rights of a woman's heritage are not because she's a woman, but because she is a human being endowed with rights by her creator. She went on to debunk fallacies spoken by men in power at the time, such as women were the agencies of evil, and that the world perceived us to be more susceptible to temptation than men. That women do not possess brains capable of development. And that the biggest event our nation would face would be war and, well, only physical strength, men, can deal with war. These things were spoken from the pulpits in the name of religion. Even today, words of the same vitriol are used in our country to keep people from having equal rights. My proud moment came following the convention when Carrie Chapman Catt 
and Mary Anthony and many of my sisters in the movement came to my home on Glen Street for tea. The 19th Amendment wasn't ratified until August of 1920. After being turned down in New York State in 1914, but then passed by New Yorkers in 1917. And it may be interesting to note that Washington County and Glens Falls voted overwhelmingly for the women's vote, while Warren County remained opposed. I am glad that I lived long enough to see women given a more equal share in our country. When I died at the age of 95, I knew that I had made a difference. I knew that I had helped to make our country better by empowering women to become more equal citizens. The courage and zeal of the suffragists must be cherished and never forgotten. Mothers, teach your daughters, but most importantly, Teach your sons. Thank you. All right, so a couple other things that happened before 19, past 1919. Jeanette Rankin, you may have heard of in 1917. She was the first woman elected to Congress. Um, and in 1918, she did open the deba debate on the suffrage amendment in the House, um, but it failed to pass in the Senate. Um, in 1918, Michigan, South Dakota, and Oklahoma uh, passed uh, women's suffrage. Um, and in 1918, President Woodrow Wilson did finally state his support for a federal amendment. But before we got to him agreeing to that amendment, uh, we have to talk about what he did to some of the suffragists uh, in 1917. Uh, National Women's Party, uh, headed by Alice Paul, they started to picket in front of the White House. Um, they named themselves the Silent Sentinels. And you can see here some of the, you have the sign there with um, Inez's quote there, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? The photo on the bottom right, the woman in white, is actually a police officer who is arresting the women. Um, so they were, uh, at first, actually, President Wilson was kind of like, eh, let them do their thing. He took them out hot chocolate, or he didn't personally, but he had hot chocolate taken out to them, them and he kind of tolerated it for a while. And then he got started getting annoyed, and so, and he was taking a lot of grief for it, so he actually started having them arrested. Um, and they were put, a lot of them were put into the Occoquan, Occoquan workhouse. Um, they were force-fed, um, they were not treated well. Um, they were put in solitary confinement. Um, Alice Paul, they tried to undermine her credibility with the public. Um, and this is a, um, a quote from the newspaper at the time. 22 hunger-striking militant suffragists were released yesterday, including Miss Lucy Burns, you can see a picture of her there in jail. Uh, whom guards described as worth her weights in wild cats. Uh, Miss Alice Paul, who can throw a shoe 20 feet and hit a window every time. And Mrs. Lawrence Lewis, whose imitation of a siren has had the attendants dodging imaginary automobiles ever since she went to board at the district's expense. And you can see awful, the, the awful uh, drawing there of torturing women in prison by force-feeding them. But by January 1918, President Wilson finally spoke out in support of a federal amendment, and the 19th Amendment passed in August of 1919, which is why we celebrate on August 26th. Uh, the amendment, of course, then had to go out to the states for ratification. Um, and it began to hit resistance in the South. Um, both NASA and the National Women's Party turned their attention to Tennessee. Um, the, voice, the vote was very, very close, and it came down to one vote. It was a young First Assemblyman, Harry Byrne. And you can see there an envelope addressed to him. 
It came to him from his mother. And in it she wrote, Dear son, hurrah and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. I noticed some of the speeches against. They were bitter. I have been watching to see how you stood, but I haven't noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. Your mother. And I'm happy to say that he followed his mother's advice and it was ratified. So in 1920, you've got the ratified amendment. Um, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, they've done what they set out to do, right? It ceases to exist. So its organization becomes the nucleus of the League of Women Voters. You can see there the, the poster there. And the 19th Amendment to the Constitution reads, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. This is a wonderful picture of Alice Paul at her headquarters in um, Washington, D.C., unfurling the flag in celebration there, the suffrage flag. But her work wasn't over with yet. Uh, in 1923, uh, she introduced uh, the ERA, Equal Rights Amendment, which reads, Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. And in case you're not aware of it, it did pass, but it has never been ratified. Uh, even today, uh, I, I know last year a couple states ratified it. I don't know if this year any state has ratified it or not. Um, they still, they just need like two or three uh, left to, to ratify it. But then the question comes, they've actually, ex you know, extended their time. You know, does it have to go back to the beginning? It's a whole legal mess. But anyway, it's never been uh, passed. There is no Equal Rights Amendment. Even though we talk about the ERA, it's never been pa never been ratified. Uh, it was passed in 1972. Um, Alice Paul said, "I never doubted that equal rights was the right direction. Most reforms, most problems are complicated, but to me, there's nothing complicated about ordinary equality." And I'm going to finish with just a, a quote from Matilda Jocelyn Gage. She wrote this in 1880. Let all government cease from off the face of the earth if we cannot build up a government of equality. A rebel, how glorious the name sounds when applied to woman. O oh, rebellious woman, to you the world looks in hope. Upon you has fallen the glorious task of bringing liberty to the earth and all of the inhabitants thereof.